March edition of The Coffee House, where in the next hour, David Mamet gets the writing credit for the satirical film Wag the Dog, but his screenplay was adapted from Larry Beinhardt's novel American Hero. Larry joins us for Writer's Block. Also, tax advice for home business people on Coffee House Forum. We'll consider the therapeutic effects of pets on humans and tune into the African beat of Laurier Addy on musical traditions. Performance poet Alona Popper takes us to her grieving house, plus the people speak. Should Iraq invade the United States? And Tacoma's top-selling books and video rentals. Hi, and welcome to Coffee House Forum. I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but April 15th is just around the corner. So it's high time that you figure out what's in that new federal tax law and start thinking creatively about how poorly you made out in 97. Tax preparation is a drag for everyone, but if you earn most of your income as an employee, then filing isn't all that complex. Or if you're rich and can afford a bookkeeper as well as an accountant, then it's no hassle at all. But what if you're self-employed and operate a business out of your home? Lots of folks do. And they're subject to very special rules under the Internal Revenue Code. With me is home businessman Tacoman Steve Mencher and CPA and certified financial planner Alan Bergamini. Welcome, both of you, to the Coffee House. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Steve, uh, tell us a little bit about your home business. Sure. I uh, run Mensch Media. I'm the CEO. I'm also the only employee, and I write and produce media things, radio programs, television programs, uh, internet sites. So I consider myself a writer producer. Okay. And why don't you tell us about the sorts of tax problems that you face? Sure. Uh, I just this year, we, we added on to an office to our house. Uh, it's the place where now I'm going to be doing all my business. And I know that uh, since we got a home equity loan, I'll be deducting uh, the interest on that loan as part of my personal taxes. Right. But I was just thinking as I was going over all the money that I'm going to have to pay Uncle Sam on April 15th, whether there's not some way that I can suck up some of that $10,000 or so that we put into the office as a business expense. Uh, it, can I do that as part of my business expenses? Absolutely. As a uh, home business person, you're entitled to claim certain deductions for your business out of your home. And actually, there is some good news this year in the new tax law uh, pertaining to home businesses. Uh, one of the biggest items that you'd be interested in, Steve, is the new rules for home office use. Now, it's good news and bad news. The good news is they've liberalized the rules, but the bad news is they're starting in 1999. But it gives us a year to plan ahead um, but this year we're dealing with 1997 and then 1998 taxes, and we've got to go with the current rules, which mean if you have your own office that you run your business out of exclusively, you are allowed to deduct essentially all the costs associated with that office, and in addition, you are allowed to take a percentage of the other costs associated with operating your home. So in effect, you get to turn some personal expenses into business expenses. And what you do is you figure out how large your office is, is in comparison to your residence, and you take a pro rata expense of all your personal deductions. Well, it sounds like a great idea, but it seems first, just if you can help me figure out, am I double dipping if I take both the interest, all the interest expense, on my personal taxes, and I try to get some of that construction expense right. of that money on my business expense. Can I do both? Well, your situation is unique in that you have spent costs specifically for the office. So you're going to what they call capitalize your expenses. Um, the expense of building the addition, those uh, IRS does not allow you to deduct those in full in one year. You have to depreciate those over a period of 39 years for commercial property. So don't go, uh, don't spend that tax <laughs> deduction anytime soon. Um, the home office, the interest expense particular to that addition can be deducted as a business expense um, on your Schedule C if you're self-employed in your case, on your um, corporation if uh, the corporation is the uh, employer in which it is. Let me ask you about what you mentioned regarding pro rata. Um, charges against other parts of your house. Right. Does that mean, for instance, that you can charge a portion of your electricity and gas? Does it mean that uh, you can charge a portion of the cost of tending to your lawn as part of your home office expense? 
The IRS allows what's called ordinary and necessary business expenses. That's their great catch-all. And uh, remember, the IRS is enforcing the rules. The Congress makes the rules. Uh, the law says that you're allowed to claim deductions for your home office based on square footage. Uh, for most people, that's you know how many rooms are in the house divided by, um, take your office divided by the number of rooms in the house, rather. Um, and you can deduct a pro rata expense for utilities. Lawn maintenance, you can say that's ordinary and necessary if, for example, you meet business clients at your home. Um, you know, lawn maintenance, shrubbery, landscaping, improvements to your walkway. Uh, so you have a, might have a separate entrance to your home office. So you can uh, be creative, be imaginative. And it's going to get even better in 99, you say? It's going to get even better, not in terms of uh, necessarily what you can deduct, but it's going to get better in terms of uh, they're liberalizing the rules. Um, right now, if you know many people who are home-based businesses are actually doing business away from their home. You know, they're going out and meeting clients. And up until now, those ex the expense of keeping your home office, even if it was your only office, was not necessarily deductible. And Congress said, well, that's not fair. Uh, we've got to change the law. And uh, now the law says, uh, you know, if you operate in, even for administrative and managerial purposes only, uh, even if you have another office somewhere else, you will, will be entitled to claim a home office deduction. So that's a big uh, improvement. Great. One of the things I want to do a better job on these next few years is retirement expenses, and I'm pretty much confused now. I've got a SEP IRA, I've got a regular IRA, my wife has her own IRA, and the th next thing I want to figure out is how I can get the business part of what I do to put in separate money from the personal part of what I do so that if I have extra money left over in the business, I'd like to be funneling all that tax-free into retirement. So how do I maximize the retirement dollars? Great question. Retirement planning is you know, on the top of everyone's mind, you know, us baby boomers especially. Um, and IRS has some good news, or Congress rather, has some good news regarding new retirement plans. You've got more options now than ever before. You've got the SEP IRAs. Uh, starting in 97, you have what's, what's that called for? a Simplified Employee Pension Plan. Okay, good. okay. Uh, as opposed to the newer plans uh, that started in 1997, uh, Simple Retirement Plans. Now, Simple is an acronym. It uh, means it doesn't mean that it's uncomplicated. <laughs> if you can figure out, uh, Congress doesn't do too much that's uh, uncomplicated. But uh, a simple plan is an option for home-based businesses, self-employed persons who may not have the higher income levels that are needed to get a substantial uh, chair, uh, contribution, um, pension plan contribution. Um, for example, a SEP IRA, that's based on 15% of your income. Uh, if you make a $50,000 salary from your corporation, you will be allowed a 15% uh, retirement plan contribution. Another change. The tax this, consequence on that fifteen thousand. Oh, the tax reasons. consequence is that the fifteen thousand dollars can be put into a retirement plan, which is a tax deferred plan uh, that w you will not pay income tax on the money as you earn it, uh, and the earnings and the future appreciation will be uh, tax free until you take out the money at age generally after you're fifty nine and a half. Um, Does that help you? It helps me a little bit, but uh, again, I'd like to, if I have, you know, $10,000 left over at the end of the year, I'd like to maximize the amount that I can put as mm -hmm. part of the business, and then I'd like to sort of match it in my personal bank account so that I'm sort of doubling my money, which is, which is what I'd like to achieve. But it sounds like I can sort of get there part of the way. You can get there part of the way. There's overall limits to how much you can put in, right. and it's typically based on 25% of your pay. Mm -hmm. um, you can put 100% in. Um, you can in some plans, for example, the simple plan will let you waive that 25% limitation on the contribution because it's based, uh, you can take a salary, for example, of $10,000 and put in a $6,000 contribution. Mm -hmm. um, but the overall limit is 25% and it's, it's complicated. You need to have a certain type of plan in order to take a 25% deduction. Uh, a SEP IRA, for example, is limited to the 15%. A simple IRA is limited to, to $6,000. A KEO plan can go up to 25%, which is a plan for self-employed individuals. So um, you know, really the best thing to do is figure out before the end of the year to try to project 
what you will be earning and what you could possibly put away for uh, retirement planning. And right. Yeah, well, that is very helpful. You know, when we were talking about the lawn and the walk and all of that before, it brought to mind a lot of other things that I do as part of my regular life that I'd like to be able to convince the tax man or for my business, and in a sense mm -hmm. are. I, the Washington Post I need to read every day. I get the New York Times I've been writing off you know, every day. I, I'm in, since I'm in the television business, would the tax man be okay with my taking my entire cable bill uh, off of taxes, uh, you know, all the time. If uh, if I said I needed to see cable, and as how about his right? wardrobe? Yeah. wardrobe, yes, and, and, uh, and my wardrobe. Okay, you need your glasses. You know, there's a. <laughs> I've seen a lot of creative deductions over the years, um, but what I tell clients is that uh, ordinary and necessary are IRS's guidelines, and if you can justify based on your type of business that uh, you need a video machine, you need a uh, tape players, you need a certain size TV, big screen TV, and that you can show that that's used for business purposes, then absolutely 100% of that cost can be uh, deducted. That said, is it not a red flag if uh, one year you're not claiming any of these things, the next year you're claiming all of these things that Steve mentioned, doesn't that say to the IRS, if they're auditing, now let's take a closer look? Well, you don't want to look, you don't want to highlight these things. Uh, you will not call them your, your big screen TV. Uh, video equipment, production equipment uh, would be a more technical term. Um, and typically you don't want to have too many deductions that are out of line. When you fill out a Schedule C, for example, for a self-employed individual, there's a business code. And the business code tells IRS what type of business you operate. And it's the same on the uh, corporate return as well. And based on that, IRS will look at certain ratios they have based on their studies of similar businesses. And if you fall out of line on any of those expenses by a large amount, and no one knows the secret amount that uh, that is, uh, you can be a call for audit. And upon an audit, as long as you have good records and you've not pushed the envelope too far, you should be, uh, you should be fine. Do they send a guy out to your house? I mean, this is one thing I, I thought about with the home office, for instance. I took, you know, 15% of the square footage of the house or something. I didn't take a tape measure. I, I figured, as you said, the room is, we only have right. three bedrooms. And well, the bedrooms. until you said that, they weren't going to send someone out <laughs> right. to your house. But, uh, do, do they send a guy out or, or a woman or whoever they have to send out? How does it work? No, IRS, of course, is kinder and gentler now. We all know <laughs> that. They've uh, been uh, beat up pretty, pretty well in the last uh, year. Um, and actually, this year, their audit rate is, is down in, from prior years. But still, it is highest for self-employed individuals, particularly Schedule C filers. Mm. Actually, a Schedule C filer has a, a twice the likelihood of being audited as a regular 1040 filer. So that's another reason that it was good of me to have incorporated. Incorporation, saying. the incorporation audit rate, especially for small corporations, is a lot lower. Mm -hmm. For Schedule Cs with uh, incomes of over, uh, gross receipts of over $100,000, the odds of getting audited are actually three times higher, or almost three times higher than a regular. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to be careful. You want to watch the expenses. You don't want to deduct all of your improvements in one year. Uh, you probably don't want to claim a loss because of uh, extraordinary type deductions. But uh, you want to do what's allowable, and you want to maximize your write-offs. Sure. Do we have time to talk about transportation? Because I... I wish we did. Oh, we Unfortunately, <laughs> that about busts our budget of time okay. for this show. Uh, many thanks to Steve Mencher and Alan Bergamini for joining thanks. us. Remember, it's far better to receive an envelope from the IRS with a refund check than with a penalty notice. <laughs> there you I'm go. I'm Mark Cohen, good and this has been Coffee House Forum. Humans, author Larry Beinhart, should Iraq invade America, and African jummer Laurie Addy. But first, Alona Popper's Grieving House. In the grieving house, my heart swollen, as though grief or just the knowledge of your death 
your passing last breath. We're something that's pooling, collecting inside, filling my tissues, my chest and lungs, esophagus, my throat, my head. My heart is pale with water, distended like a waxy plant. The tears spill over from saturation. That is where it began, the cancer near your heart, your sternum. A lump came there, and now I carry water like a lily pad, my own heart a white flower, full and spilling over and limp with water. It will go someday, be gone, like you. in sickness and in health. Humans have kept pets for many thousands of years and there seems to be more good reason for this than simply satisfying a fancy. Animals can be wonderful company. They can teach children to nurture smaller creatures and studies have shown that older people with pets live longer than they otherwise would. But pets can also endanger their owners and even people they never meet in several ways including passing on some deadly diseases. Here to explain how to keep pets safe for everyone is Dr. Pat Kremelmeyer, known more simply as Dr. K, a certified veterinarian who works at the Tacoma Park Animal Clinic. Welcome to Dr. K. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for having us here. Sure. You're a pet owner yourself, dogs, cats. Dogs, you cats, birds, hamsters, hamsters, a lot of kids on the weekends fish. too. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, what are the benefits then, just some of them, of why pets are good for us? Pets are wonderful for us. <clears throat> Excuse me, as you said earlier, a lot of studies, uh, quite a few done recently, have shown that in the elderly or in disabled people that pets add a companionship level that's not there. And also, too, for especially for some of the disabled people, those pets provide a quality of life that the people wouldn't otherwise have. Dogs that are trained to specific tasks. Like um, seeing dogs, that's... Uh, seeing eye dogs right? are a very common example, but also dogs are trained, for instance, to brace themselves to allow a person without use of their legs to use the dog to prop on. I know of a dog who was trained to retrieve items from the woman's purse because her fingers were very short and she couldn't reach into her purse and get out her wallet. So in those instances, the dogs provided an even greater service than just the companionship that they gave. Dogs and cats are the most common pets, aren't they? I read recently a Gallup poll found 57% of Americans own a dog or a cat. A That's lot of Americans own dogs yeah. or cats. There are some uh, dangers, though, from pets. Perhaps we can start off with some of the more exotic pets. And uh, what kind of ailments can they bring us, perhaps without us knowing? Well, you know, the iguanas have become very popular recently. You can go into any pet store in any mall and you see all kinds of little lizards and geckos and iguanas for sale. Well, a couple of studies have shown that some of these animals were harboring salmonella bacteria, the same salmonella bacteria that can cause even a fatal diarrhea in us. And the reason why the little green turtles were banned from pet store sales in this country many, many years ago. So that's a health risk that people hadn't really considered. Also to keep in mind, too, that a lot of these animals are captured from the wild. They're not pets like our dogs and cats are. Mm -hmm. They have sharp teeth. They don't find comfort in a human touch. And so they just even the bite could represent a health risk itself. These animals have bacteria in the mouth, just like a dog or cat does. What about snakes? Because those are pretty exotic, and some people keep them. Snakes are a very popular pet. Um, snakes are nice. I've had snakes as pets myself. Uh, but there was a recent story of a man who had a venomous snake or yeah. snakes and had been bitten by them, was severely poisoned. They had a large rush to find the antidote. I should point out, though, that in this area we have dangerous creature laws, and 
he was not legally allowed to have those venomous snakes anyway because of the danger they represented. Right, so you're not meant to have illegal pets, obviously, as well, which uh, <laughs> right. bring you danger. Um, how about some of the more common pets, dogs and cats? And uh, Dogs and cats are like. wonderful, but just like us and our children, they do require health care. For instance, all dogs and cats must be vaccinated against rabies after four months of age by law in the state of Maryland. Uh, the first vaccine they receive I, is, is I think good. we have a video actually showing you giving a shot to your Yes, dog. this is actually one of my personal yeah. dogs, Fred, who... Uh, I thought he was going to have to donate blood to help save a puppy's life and was kind of disappointed that he was just getting a shot. I think they're about to start it. Um, and uh, what about cats? There's some special ailment, ailments, um, particularly dangerous for pregnant women, um, that cats get. Well, toxoplasmosis, which is an organism, can be... There's contact in two ways. One is that a cat who's shedding oocysts in, to the litter box and a pregnant or trying to get pregnant person is cleaning the litter box can inhale or ingest those oocysts and receive toxoplasmosis. But the other danger is raw or undercooked meat, and that is actually the most common type of transmission for toxoplasmosis. And um, what about things that animals can pick up, like fleas, and um, they can also pick up li lice and um, uh, ticks that carry Lyme disease, which is in this area. I think uh, the video is on now. If you can, that's your dog uh, yep. getting a shot there at the clinic. Yes, it is. That's Fred, and that's Dr. Malachi, one of our new doctors, who's actually from Tacoma Park, and we're quite proud to have her back working with us at the clinic. And how often do the rabies shots have to be given? Well, the first time a pet receives a rabies shot, it's licensed for one year. After that, they're licensed for three years. And I should also point out, because a lot of people have cats that are indoors and say, well, my cat doesn't need shots, it's required by law. And the reason is that rabies is a fatal disease. You get rabies, you die, that's it. Nobody survives. Never. Nobody survives. No animal survives, no person survives. And that's why we take such a hard line on that. And um, do people keep this up, or do they slip off after a while? Yes, they forget. Well, a lot of vet clinics are computerized now. So, for instance, in our vet clinic, if we've seen your pet, you'll get a postcard to remind you of when the shots are due. Okay. How about Lyme disease? Does, does that just get transferred to humans, or do pets get it as well? And how would you know if your pet has it? Dogs get Lyme disease, and they share many of the same symptoms that people have. Uh, swelling and lameness in different joints that shifts around fever, generalized malaise. In people, they tell you to look for that bullet mark. In dogs, it's kind of hard to see because of the hair coat, but actually that bullet occurs as well. Okay. And fleas. Uh, we have a variety of flea repellents and flea cures here. Um, what, can they be dangerous or are they just very annoying when they spread from animals? Well, in the state of Colorado, bubonic plague has emerged again and that is transmitted by a rat flea. Mm. Fortunately, we don't have that here, but certainly the fleas are not healthy for the pets. It causes them to scratch and lick at themselves and the fleas will bite us. They don't like us. They'll spit our blood out and go look for a dog, but they will bite us and those, those are just as annoying as any other insect bite. I actually bought these products to point out too that animals get intestinal parasites. Yeah. And especially in this area, we all have to live together. It's for dogs. These are some of the products. Heart guard for cats. Cats can get heartworm disease. Um, this is pretty recent news for us as vets, but I don't think you can pick it up on the mic. But this product also deworms the cat for hookworms. Uh -huh, well, yes. you, you say, why do you that. care about that? Well, you care yeah. about that because this cat's defecating in the same yard where your child is playing, and these hookworm larvae from the dogs or cats can migrate through cuts in the skin and actually cause a disease in a person. And what about uh, the blindness in children? That can actually happen from that. Uh, yes, it can, and that's disease. very real. It's not to just be hysterical, but that's very real, uh, especially here in the Mid-Atlantic. We share southern winters like we've had this year where not much has happened. We really haven't ever had a killing frost. Uh, we have the Sentinel. This is a brand new product put out by uh, Novartis that combines their flea pill with their heartworm preventative, which gets all of the intestinal parasites of dogs and the heartworm mm -hmm. and keeps fleas from being able to reproduce. This is a pretty amazing thing. One pill a month, no fleas, no intestinal parasites, no heartworms. This is really an amazing breakthrough for us. And uh, what about the, the simple bite of animals? You do get some dogs that are more vicious than others. Rottweilers, of course, are in the press all the time about attacking children. Are these pets that uh, 
are wise to keep or, or are they just too dangerous for people's health? Some pets are dangerous and we've all seen horrible reports, um, for instance the Rottweiler in Rockville a few years ago. Um, not all Rottweilers are mean, small dogs can be mean too, but certain breeds have more of a tendency to have a bad temper and also more of a tendency to be owned by people who like that bad temper and that puts us in some bad situations sometimes. Okay. Uh, children should always of course never approach a dog that's outside. Mm -hmm. Even my daughter who's a vet's child I tell you never go up to a strange animal because you don't know if that is a friendly animal or not. Just common sense precautions. Um, since the relationship between people and pets can be so close what happens when the pets die, as they do tend to, before, before the owners, because their life expectancy is shorter? People who have lost a pet, especially a beloved pet they've had for many years, should expect to grieve. Mm -hmm. And that grief is just as real as, as it is for losing a close friend or another family member. This is a pet who's been a great part of the family. Um, we're fortunate to be in an area like Washington where there are actually even counseling and support groups. I mean, sometimes this pet has represented the only companionship that someone's had for many, many years. The boyfriends have come and gone, they've moved away from home, college friends have come and gone, and here's the faithful dog of 15 years, and that's a very real loss for people. Right. Finally, where should someone get a pet? Should you go to pounds or pet shops? What's your favorite? I've got to say, I've worked with the animal shelters and with animal rescue groups for a lot of years, and I really encourage people, number one, research the kind of pet you want to have. You know, if you've got a lot of children in a very, very active lifestyle, you might not want a little tiny dog that wants to lay on the sofa all day. The library is a great source of pictures of the dogs to tell you about their personalities, and visit the local animal shelter. There are many, many wonderful pets to be found in the shelters or through the breed rescue groups. Sometimes people move or lose a housing situation, they have to give up a pet that's a perfectly nice pet. Sometimes the dogs are given up or cats because they're ill-mannered or have bitten, but a lot of times they're just a nice dog that needs a home. Um, also the library or even the internet is a good source of dog breeders. Some people want a purebred dog with papers um, and you can look up reputable breeders. A big thank you to Dr. K for tips on caring for our pets in the right way. Until next time, for In Sickness and In Health, I'm Kathy Christensen. scientific coffeehouse poll on the question, should Iraq invade the U.S.? And Marya Yaddy doesn't miss a beat. Honey, <laughs> Ani nyam pon ji onupa koko num so di chire nyami nyam pon ji onupa koko num so di chire nyami nyam pon ji onupa koko num so di chire nyami nyam pon ji onupa e Ani ta ta shalom ta ta shalom ta ta shalom ta ta shalom ya fri nyam pon yeshu a se Ani ta ta shalom ya fri nyam pon yeshu a se ta ta shalom
Thank you very much. Welcome, Larye Ade. Larye, the R is silent. <laughs> Thank you. From Ghana and now living in Washington, Washington D.C. Thank you. What was that that you you sung for us? It was uh, also a song of praise to God that is our protector, is our creator. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome you formally to the musical tradition segment. Thank you very much. Here at uh, Tacoma Coffee House. Thanks. Um, what do you call the drum you were playing? You know that I know, but for our <laughs> viewers out there, we should, uh, we should discuss what the name is. Yeah. This drum is called Dono. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't know? <laughs> Oh, oh, don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. All right, okay. Right. I thought it was like the name of a teenager. You yeah, know, they don't know. <laughs> it's called Dono, and uh, you can see it uh, all over in West Africa in different countries, and they use it for festive occasions and all that. And they talk. They're talking drums too, just like right. you see me doing some few things. And what's what's going on there is as you depress the the uh, That's right. straps, then that raises the change tension. The, let's change let's the hear tension. the raised tension. Speaks. That's right. And you don't have to put money in it. No. It's, a, it's an African cell phone. That's right. Right? That's right. But well, African culture is not for money. It's for discipline right. and respect. That's you know I was joking. That's right. <laughs> Can't ball me out on my own show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you've been in the States now for about how long? A year and a half. Right. And you told me when we uh, were talking off camera that you have you toured with some pretty, pretty famous guys. Yeah. Um, I was in 93 with uh, Peter Gerber's uh, Womad tour. The Womad tour. Yeah, that is a uh, word of uh, music, arts, arts and, and dance. dance in um, Germany and uh, England and Spain, Switzerland. And then in 94, right. we were in the United States, some few places, and then um, we went back to England and finished our show out there and then went back. And, and from that tour, you got a little taste of the United States. Oh, and yeah. Here you are. Yeah. And now I'm back here to share my little knowledge, the little bit I know with uh, Americans. <laughs> you know a lot. You know a lot. Can you play maybe uh, one of the other drums, do a song with that? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. You take it away. Let's see. What was that one? That one was from the uh, northern part of Ghana. Okay. And you will see it mostly when they have in the festive occasions. The name of the drum? It's called Blekete. 
Lekate. Yeah. Um, now I notice there's a uh, there's a uh, little rawhide strap going across the top, which makes it sound very much like. Oh, actually, I should say our snare drums mm -hmm. are probably. That's right. Derivative of that. Yeah, and I, this drum is made for what exactly the dance for? Because most there are a lot of other drums and uh, and dances that, uh, you know, do done by hunters, and they you know they do the uh, the act of yeah. how hunters go to hunt and how they hunt animals and all that. So. Now, when you mentioned dancing, that reminds me, you play with a couple of groups mm -hmm. here in the Washington area. Yeah. We might as well plug them. <laughs> one, one is... Uh, Concurrent, the is West a, African. Yeah, and they've been around forever yeah. in this area. Yeah. Um, played at the Kennedy Center. Yeah. Various festivals. Yeah. What about, uh, what's the other group that you play with? Yeah, I perform sometimes with my uh, relatives in Virginia. They, they all live here a couple of years ago, so... Wow. Sometimes we get together and we have... How many drums would there be in a, when you're performing, say, with your relatives? Um, we have about 20, 20, 25 drums. Wow. Yeah. Not to be missed. Yeah. Um, so we, what would you like to take us out with? We've got a... <laughs> what drum? Well, let's uh, go with that little drum there with... Uh, with a little... The dono. Yes. I'm learning. <laughs> Thank you again, and uh, take us out. Thank you. And we'll meet again. Thank you very much. Coming up, writer's block. The film Wag the Dog was adapted from the novel American Hero by our guest, Larry Beinhardt. But first, a coffee house exclusive. Hi, my name is Michael and this is Matt. Hi guys. Hey. Okay. You think you're rocks should the United States? Uh, what does that mean anyways? Do you think Iraq should bomb the United States? No. No. Oh. no, 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 no. Okay, you think the United States should bomb Iraq? Uh, yeah. 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 How come? Mm. I don't know. What do you think, Matt? Oh, no. Uh, like what kind of rock? Like a rock you throw or? The United States doesn't have the only specialist that can do this. They could have found a French specialist, a Russian specialist to go in there, and everything would have been fine, and we would have never been to this point. And Perhaps that would just uh, be just the meltdown that would cause a state of bliss in our society. So I say, come on over, let's 
play some cards. What jokes do you know? Just like to say that when the Iraqis come up to Chesapeake, I'll be down there with a gun. Other than that, I think we ought to mind our own business. In our lifetime, we've only made war in the United States on little brown people. Why is that? I mean, I think it's just pretty sad if you can't prove your manhood with your White House interns that you feel you have to do it, bombing other young people overseas. Hi, my name is Nelson. I'm a Silver Spring Coma Park resident, and I think instead of involving our nations in a real conflict, I think Bill Clinton, who's got something to prove, and Saddam Hussein, who's the villain of the piece, should get together in a square combat professional wrestling, however the way you want to do it, and to make sure it's fair and impartial. I mean, Kenneth Starr can uh, basically, you know, uh, mediate or be the referee, and instead of killing any Iraqis, and instead of spending billions of American dollars to do this, I think you could make it to the death, you could make it best two out of three falls, loser has to uh, leave town by the end of the match, but I think that's really the only way to go. imitates life, or so the saying goes. Great literature, music, and film can emerge out of our daily routines, but sometimes it seems life imitates art. When the film Wag the Dog was released, it coincided with actual events. The plot of the movie included a presidential sex scandal involving a young girl at the White House and the war created to distract the public. In real life, the Monica Lewinsky story was breaking even as we faced the possibility of real military action in the Persian Gulf. Life is imitating art. The film Wag the Dog is based on the novel American Hero, and the novel also has its roots in everyday life. Its characters include a very real American president, his secretary of state, and some real and imagined Hollywood personalities. The author of American Hero is the very real Larry Beinhardt, and he is my guest tonight. Larry Beinhardt is a novelist. He has published several books as well as short stories and articles. He has also produced television commercials and industrial films. He is the recipient of the Fulbright Award from Oxford University, as well as the Edgar Award and the Gold Dagger Award. Welcome to the Coffee House. Thank you very much. Very pleased to be here. How did you come to write this novel, American Hero? I was watching the war in the Gulf. Yeah. Um, I turned to the person I was watching it with, who I presume was my wife, <laughs> um, and I said, this is a made-for-TV movie. Uh -huh. um, and uh, they didn't get the joke or get that I meant that it was really a made-for-TV movie, that, that um, this had been designed and was being run by a theatrical intelligence, mm -hmm. a cinematic intelligence, um, and that I really imagined that there was a director, maybe George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, somebody like that, not, not Francis Ford Coppola. It would have been too Baroque. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, you know, somebody, you know, like, into control. Right. 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 Heroes mm -hmm. and villains and classic. Right. Classic forms was calling the shots on right. this movie. And um, I, I imagined that Norman Schwarzkopf had come from Central Casting. Mm -hmm. Right. They were going to do an Eisenhower character. And they went through a bunch of people. And, and they came across Schwarzkopf, um, who was an interesting choice. He wasn't your classic Eisenhower type. At all, type. yeah. But he had that, that persona. He had that... He was a great guy to play a, ger uh, a general, a German general. Uh. <laughs> and, uh, and I try to explain that. Mm -hmm. And whoever it was, probably my wife, still didn't really get it. Uh -huh. Right? Mm -hmm. So in order to explain the joke, I ended up with this 500-page novel with 123 footnotes. Right, right. But it is funny, right? You oh, read it's it? very yeah. funny. Okay, so. Except that you really make the case for it. I mean, in, the, in American Hero, you really do see the making of this war. Oh, yeah. Well, by the, time, by the time I finished yeah. the book, I was convinced that, in fact, this is what happened. Um, in the book, I, I attributed to Lee Atwater. Mm -hmm. I liked Lee Atwater. I didn't know him personally, but right, I, I really right, liked right. his um, um, total um, disrespect for um, restraint and yeah. convention right, and, right. And, mm -hmm. and political correctness and you know, I, I, I would have voted against any of his candidates, sure. but I enjoyed him as a, as a character. Right. So I imagined him on his deathbed, mm -hmm. right, on the one hand pretending that he had 
I'm sorry for all the horrible things he'd done. And right. He'd been called to Christ and been saved. Right, right, right. right. I'd hate to think that was true. Mm -hmm. I really would. Mm -hmm. I'd like to think that on his deathbed, Lee Atwater was planning one last trick. And one. the last trick was this memo that he's prepared that makes the case um, that the president, if he's really in trouble, right. should go to war. Mm -hmm. And if he is going to go to war, he has to hire somebody in Hollywood to package to the it. war. Mm -hmm. um, Which becomes when, World War II to, to the video. Right, to, to video. Right. Which, um, well, which, it was a made-for-TV movie. It's not right. a, you know, a theatrical release would be like World War II. Okay. Right? But this with, is for with, television, with, with small With all screen. the grit and the tragic endings and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why at the end, Saddam, when they went to Saddam Hussein and said, mm -hmm. how would you like to play Hitler in a major American motion picture? Mm -hmm. Of course, he was thrilled. He said, oh, yeah, I love American right. movies. I love Hitler. Right. This is like a dream role for right. me. I'd love to do this. Right, right. And, and, and then, he, then he thought about it. He said, wait a minute. I remember how that ends. Right, right. And he and called up and he got his agent. His agent called and said, hey. I want to do it, but could we change the ending? Right, right. right? And they said, well, it's just the made-for-TV version. Mm -hmm. And sure. Right. Yeah. So. Um, so this is how I visualized the war. Uh -huh. um, and this is what was taken. It was put together. It's also what was used in the film, Wag the Dog. It's the making of this war. In, it's the visualization. In, in, the, um, in the film, mm -hmm. what they do is they create the illusion of, of a war, war. ways you, you're, the, you're not where, 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 where what I said was that the war was real, real. but the, it was staged right. so as to appeal to the American people. Okay. All right? And we have a little bit of tape to roll from the Wag the Dog film okay. just uh, uh, to go along with uh, what we're talking about. A song, some visuals, we need, you know, it's a pageant. If he could produce a war for television that the public thinks is a real war, I mean, that's the greatest masterpiece he'll ever have. These are chips. We need it for the arm position on the screen. It'll be a kitten. We'll punch it in later. Perception is everything, not reality. Put the, the village behind it. Give me some sound of screaming. Punch in a calico kit. I have 19 screens here. I can't see one calico kit. What? The president wants a white one. He, he wants a white one? Let me talk. He's mobilizing the 6th Fleet. Why do I hate it when they start to meddle? We can link that to the press. They can downlink it on Telstar 401 Transporter 21. Everything is show business. Is it really that far-fetched that a Hollywood producer would be hired to make the president look better? We just received information that the young Albanian national from this video is attempting to escape terrorist reprisals in her village. When it's cooking, it's cooking. So this is this same thing that we see in Wag the Dog is what happens in your book, except that your book is about a real war, the real war. Is okay. What, what you see in this clip from Wag the Dog mm -hmm. is um, creating the illusion of a war. Mm -hmm. All right. right. A lot of historical precedent for this. Right. Um, the movie that we see as the documentary about Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. It's a film called December 7th, won an Academy Award for John Ford. It was all staged in a studio, very like this one, except it was more mechanical, because that was a mechanical age, and less electronic. Mm -hmm. But we accepted those images as real. Mm -hmm. But they referred back to a real event. This doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in the movie, it works. It's great. It's funny. Yeah. Uh, but what happens in the book is it makes this, this argument if, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, creates this plot in which uh, a director gets the assignment to create a war. Mm -hmm. And he goes through all the processes of what, what's good about war in the sense of, of public consumption, right. what's bad about war. Um, now, it sounds far-fetched and, and kind of a ridiculous concept, mm -hmm. but the truth is all right, that, for example, Colin Powell right. is quoted as saying, once you've got your battlefield plan, mm -hmm. you have to come up with your media plan mm -hmm. because you can lose a war on television. television. Mm -hmm. um, um, the American military's official history, if you will, mm -hmm. of Vietnam is that we won on the battlefield but lost on television, mm -hmm. which means, means we lost. Which means, which means the Vietnamese 
lost on the battlefield, but won on television. Mm -hmm. So the logic of it is that you could actually lose on the battlefield, but if you win on television, you can win. So then, what's more important, the television or the dead bodies? Well, and ultimately, it's the, it's television, the television and it's propaganda, and, and that's right. what I mean, the American, you know, what we proved, or what we learned in Vietnam is the American people will not stand for an ugly war. Mm -hmm. We have to be clean. We have to have a nice war. Uh -huh. We have a good to have war. A, a good, clean, dramatic war. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I'm yeah. not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that's mm -hmm. the fact of it. And I'm also saying the fact is that the people who run America and run our wars, the generals and the politicians, mm -hmm. are aware of this thinking. Right. right. Well, you in the book you talk about this very strategic plan, the smart bombs and the chimney stacks, and right. and you know how this this immediately makes us look like we're not killing children and women, but right. we're we're cleaning house. We're just getting the bad guys, yeah. and that this oh, is. A well, I mean, I, at, when I was doing the research for this book, I put myself in the position of the director. Mm -hmm. I, I put myself in the position of all the characters, okay. right? yeah. to a certain degree, mm -hmm. but mostly in the position of the director. I said, what would I do if I had been given this assignment? Mm -hmm. And one of the things he does, which I did, is I watched a lot of war movies. Mm -hmm. And one of, them, one of the movies I came across is a movie called Bombardier. Mm -hmm. In World War II, every branch of the service had their own movie. Right. The Coast Guard did, the Marines did, the um, Bombardiers did. Mm -hmm. and the issue in Bombardier is uh, a, a young Bombardier has a crisis of conscience. His mother has been writing him letters. Right. She's afraid he will kill women and children. Mm -hmm. So he, his commanders prove to him that American Bombardiers are so precise they only hit the target. Right. They don't bomb women and children. Right. The climactic scene of the movie is they fly over a Japanese munitions factory. Mm -hmm. There are three chimneys. And the bombardier says to the pilot, um, which one should I drop it in on? Drop mm -hmm. it in. And the pilot says, the middle one. He says, that's easy. They drop it. It goes right down the chimney. Mm. And the building explodes oh, outward. Right. And then, boom, 45 years later, right. we see the exact, exact same image. scene recreated for the exact same to reason, reason to yes. reassure the American public Right, that the war, war is clean, is clean and we're heroes, and right. that this is all. Now, the, 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 we only the have good side minutes. of this is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, to a certain degree, this has to reflect reality, mm -hmm. more so now than it did in World War II. Uh -huh. So I think that in the war in the Gulf, uh, the American forces went to great, great lengths to avoid as much as they could. Mm -hmm. Bombing real civilians. Oh, sir. You sir. Know? So, but they still did bomb real civilians. Oh, they did. But I. Th but again, the the influence of television is mm -hmm. both pernicious in mm -hmm. the sense that oh yeah we're staging a war for television. I believe that's really true. Right. We really did I that. I do too. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as long as you ha ha at the same time, b staging a war for television might be better than staging a war without television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because... People it, are watching. And, and it's mm -hmm. the human instinct to be revolted. Right, right. You have an analogy in the book where you're talking about football and how, what if a football game, oh, yeah. how football is like war, and what if a football game went on for days and days and people kept getting injured and then their substitutes came in and they're getting injured. And you use that to compare the Vietnam War. Right. And what yeah, we well, because, because in terms with, uh, of the media, yeah. certainly at the beginning of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. the media treated it like it was World War II. Right. Okay, we were the good guys, they were the bad guys, rah, 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 we're winning, everything's great. They treated it exactly the way they treated the Gulf War. Right. Um, they, they followed the propaganda line exactly, mm -hmm. but then it was like a football game that went on just forever. Right. As much as they could, mm -hmm. bombing real civilians. Oh, sir. And you have... just began to like get tired of the game. Absolutely. And noticed that all these people were getting killed, right. and they just kept getting killed, and, and the game wouldn't fun. end, and it wouldn't end. And right, and it's not fun anymore, and there's no right. clear heroes anymore. However, you have the clear hero in this book, right? I mean, it's it's a little different from the film in the sense <laughs> yeah. that there is yeah. a good guy, and and there, even as he has his dark side and his yeah, he does have a dark uh, side, quite I mean, a dark side, yeah. yeah. So. Um, 
We only have a couple of seconds left, but you know, Larry, thank you so much for for coming and uh, and and talking with us about American Hero. And I'm delighted. Thank you for it's having a me here. Great I hope read. I come back. It was a real page turn. Thanks. So. Thanks to Larry Beinhardt for joining us in the coffee house. I'm Lisa Page, and this has been Writer's Block. Mark's edition. See you next month in the Tacoma Coffee House.